because he held religious services that were not sanctioned by the Church of England. So he was he was having church, and he got arrested and put into jail because the Church of England did not sanction his preaching. He was a Christian man, and uh, uh, the book is about a, a man by the name of Christian, and it's an allegory of the Christian life. And so Christian... Uh, is is uh, on a journey from his hometown. Uh, his, his hometown was called the City of Destruction. And he was, uh, which is a picture of the world, and he was on a journey to the celestial city, the city that is to come, that's heaven, okay? And so Christian is carrying a heavy burden. That actually, there's, a, there's a, several versions in a movie form of this story as well, okay? So you can, you can actually... Uh, probably YouTube it and, and watch the movie if you're not a reader. And so, anyway, so he's weighed down by this great burden. He's carrying a huge pack on his back. And in the book, this is the knowledge of his sin. It becomes heavy upon him. He came to know that he was a sinner from reading the book that he carried, which is the Bible. How many know the Bible shows us what is sin? Amen. Amen. So he meets a man named Evangelist who directs him to a gate, a wicked gate. And w wicked, W-I-C-K-E-T, not wicked. A, the wicked gate, which is the beginning of the path that leads to the celestial city. So Christian, he comes under conviction and he, he realizes the only way to be saved is is to go to this wicked gate and get on the path that leads to the celestial city. And so he leaves his home, his wife, his children to save himself. He couldn't persuade them to accompany him. There's a second book uh, in, the, in the Pilgrim's Progress and in the second book, his wife Christiana uh, follows. Uh, she goes and, and she takes the path as well. So anyway, so this story is about the, the path that, that Christian takes. The rest of the story is about his life as a Christian, the adventures, the obstacles, the diversions, the temptations, and his ultimate victory uh, to be able to enter into the celestial city. So it's an allegory. It's a picture of what the Christian life is is like. Amen. And so... And so um, Praise God. I recommend that book, and I'm mentioning it because a Christian begins a journey that is going to lead him into heaven, and you and I are also on a journey. 
that leads us into heaven. Amen. We're on a path. It's, the, it's the, the path that leads to life that Jesus spoke about. We're going to read uh, in Matthew 7, verse uh, 13 and 14 about this in just a moment. I want to preach a message I'm, I'm entitling, The High Way to Heaven. The High Way to Heaven. Amen. So let's read in our text. It says in verse 13 of Matthew 7, it says, Enter by the narrow gate. For wide is the gate, and broad is the way that leads to destruction. And there are many who go in by it, because narrow is the gate, and difficult is the way which leads to life. And there are few who find it. Let's pray. Father, we ask for grace. I ask for your help and the anointing of your spirit to bring a clear-sounding word to your people, to those who have gathered here, I pray that uh, you would help us all, O oh God, in our journey. Help us to be able to make it all the way into your celestial city, that heavenly city that you have prepared for those who love you, God. And Lord, we ask that you would uh, visit us this day, bring understanding in every heart. Lord, and if there be any here who are not saved, open their hearts to receive Jesus as their Savior. In Jesus' name, amen. High way to heaven. I want to first of all talk about the low road to hell. Amen. If you're going to talk about heaven, you're going to also have to talk about hell. And so in Jesus' words, he said, Enter by the narrow gate, for wide is the gate, and broad is the way that leads to destruction. He's talking about hell. And there are many who go in by it. Now, I just want to just say a few words because I'm not preaching about hell. I'm preaching about the high way to heaven. But I just want to say a few things. Jesus said that the way to destruction is wide. He said the gate is wide and the way is wide. And so I just want to say a few things. One is it, it is very easy to go to hell. The way is wide. The gate is broad, and he says many there are that are going in that way. The truth of the matter is, every one of us before Jesus were on that road. Amen. 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 You, have you heard the term slippery slope? We were on it. We were sliding. Some of us were on a grease pole on our way to hell. But God had mercy on us. It's easy to go to hell. You, all you have to do is do what comes naturally. Amen. The natural man starts out innocent. A little baby. No, no. No nothing. Just completely innocent. But that innocent child quickly learns to be selfish, to be disobedient, to be rebellious, to lie, to cheat, <laughs> to steal. And nobody has to teach them. They just, it, it just comes natural. That's why parents need to discipline their children. Yes. Amen. 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 It's not being mean. You're not being mean because you discipline your child. The point in disciplining a child is to teach them so that they can learn to discipline themselves. Yes, amen. 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 So that they learn self-control. Amen. 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 Haven't you ever been in the store and you see a kid just tormenting his mother? <laughs> I have one. Like, I just want to go slap that kid. <laughs> and then slap the mother. <laughs> I say, why don't you discipline your child? Oh That's the word. No, I, I wouldn't do that. <laughs> but if you let a child do and have whatever they want, what you'll end up with is a wild child. Yep. Amen. Or otherwise known as a spoiled brat. Yep. And yep. and uh, people won't like their children. Yep. Amen. <laughs> In Ecclesiastes 11, uh, verse 9, King Solomon had some very sound words for young people. He said, Rejoice, O young man, in your youth, and let your heart cheer you in the days of your youth. Walk in the ways of your heart, 
and in the sight of your eyes. In other words, do whatever you want. Enjoy yourself. He says, but know that for all these, God will bring you into judgment. That's right, amen. Amen. So, you know, disciplining your child can help them to stay out of hell. Praise God. And so all we have to do to go to hell is just be ourselves. That's it. Just do what, what comes naturally. And if you do that all your life, you will go to hell. Does that mean? No. Well, it, you might think so, but it's the truth. I did what I wanted. You know, I didn't learn to discipline myself until after I got saved. My parents did their best, but it wasn't good enough. I had to get saved. Amen. Amen. So it's easy to go to hell. Jesus said the, the path to hell is wide, it's smooth, it's like a super highway. It's like a six lane super highway. And there are a lot of people on it. Amen. So let me shift gears and let's talk about the high way to heaven. Jesus said this. He said, because narrow is the gate, and difficult is the way which leads to life. Amen. And few there are who find it. Amen. Okay? So think about this. Let's look at what he actually said. He said the gate is narrow. You know, think about the, the kingdom of God is the kingdom of God is exclusive. Okay? What that means is that the kingdom of God excludes a lot of people. By nature. Why? Because it's narrow. They say, you Christians are so narrow-minded. Yes, we are. Amen. Because the gate is narrow. To enter in, you have to believe a certain thing. And the, th the certain thing you have to believe is that Jesus died on the cross for my sins, that he rose from the dead, and that if I repent, he will forgive me. Okay, so it's a very narrow entrance. There are not many paths into the kingdom of God. There's one path. There's one gate. And Jesus said it's a narrow gate, okay? So, you know, you'll hear people say, oh, there are many paths into heaven. Uh, the Hindu religion teaches that you can believe whatever you want. But the narrow gate is restrictive. What that means is that to enter the narrow gate, you can only go in. It's like a turnstile. Anybody been to a turnstile at a at an event? You know what a turnstile is? It's the it's the bar with three. It's got three bars, and you put your ticket in or your money in, and you can go through, but no one else. Just you. You have to make up the, your mind, your decision. I'm going through this gate, and when you go through, in many events, they won't let you go in with a backpack. You can't bring your own food. You can't bring your own drinks. Why? Because they want to sell you all their stuff in there. But in the kingdom of God, you, you can't go in with your baggage. Amen. Amen. You have to repent of your sin. You have to be forgiven and cleansed. Amen. You have to renounce your sin. You have to... Uh, you have to uh, uh, make a decision that, you know what? I'm not... I, I know that... This sin is going to destroy my life, and so I am going to forsake it. You know, I mean, when we were kids, we'd go to the movies, and we didn't want, want to buy their expensive candy, so we'd stash it in our pockets, you know, and, and, and go in and uh, eat our own candy, not pay $5 for a candy bar. Can't do that in heaven. Can't do that going into the kingdom of God. Jesus said, difficult is the way. Difficult is the way. How many find it a challenge to live for God? Well, you find it challenging to live for God? You know? And uh, it is a challenge. And I'll tell you why. Because it's easier to do evil than it is to do good. Amen. Isn't that true? It's easier to just, you know, uh, to, to do what our flesh wants us to do. It's easier to, to obey the flesh than it is to obey the spirit. In fact, the Apostle Paul wrote, and he said the, the spirit and the flesh are at war with one another. The Holy Spirit. Amen. The Holy Spirit's trying to get us to do good. It's that, you know, it's that proverbial 
devil on the shoulder and the, and the angel on the other shoulder. One saying, get in, get in. And the other saying, no, no. no. <coughs> it's a real battle. <coughs> and so it's easier to do evil than it is to do good. That This is why, as a Christian, one of the fruits of the Holy Spirit is the the, uh, the, uh, the gift of self-discipline. Amen. Self-discipline. Self-discipline is a must. If we're going to follow Jesus Christ, we have to resist the devil and submit to God. But you cannot resist the devil unless you submit to God. That's why it's in that order. Submit to God, resist the devil, and he will flee from you. So that's why it's hard, because the flesh is weak. Jesus told uh, the disciples, he says, you need to pray, lest you enter into temptation, lest you get into temptation, because the spirit is willing. You're, you want to do right, you want to do good, but your flesh is weak. I mean, no, our flesh is, is weak. And what it really has to do with is with the strength of our will. Amen. It's the strength of our will. Our will is powerful. And we can choose to do good or to do evil. And in fact, we do choose to do good or evil. And I'm telling you, the more you choose to do evil, the harder it is to do good. But the same is true the other way. The, the more you choose to do right and to do good according to God, the easier it is to resist evil. Because you get stronger, your will is strengthened. Yeah. Amen. This is this is one of the keys to overcoming addiction, and that and that is that you replace your addiction to evil with your addiction to good. Yeah. Habit has to do with habit. Habits are formed by repeated action. Yeah. Amen. That's why the more you come to church, the stronger you get. Yeah. You know, it, it's a, it's a choice to come to an altar and pray about things. That are happening in your life. If you're struggling with something, if you're weak in an area, you know, and, and God's dealing with you about it, when you come to church, come to the altar and pray about it. Amen. Amen. You know, don't don't be content to stay in your chair. Come and, and bring it to God and lay it at the cross. Say, not my will, but yours be done. Yeah. Amen. <coughs> so the, the hardest part, I think the most difficult thing is to make up your mind. To serve God, to follow Jesus all the way, Amen. 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 All the way. We we're talking about Judas this morning in the in the Sunday school, and how you know Jesus said, "I've chosen the twelve of you." He was talking about his apostles, and he says, "And one of you is a devil." And then John goes further and says, "He was talking about Judas, you know, because Judas was the one who betrayed him." You know, John's looking back through history, and he says, "Yeah, he was talking about G Judas at that time." He, no, none of them knew before and who it was except for Jesus. I don't believe Judas even know, knew that it was him yet. And in that is the potential that we all have to do wrong. I mean, no, we all have great potential to do evil. We can still do just as much evil as we did when we before we were enlightened. Before we got saved, we can still be very wicked. We can still be very evil. And so, so we have to learn how to exercise our will to follow Jesus. And that's not so easy, is it? No. So as you learn about Jesus, one of the things that happens as you come to church, you hear the preaching of the Word of God, you, 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 begin, you soak it in. And, you know, let me just say, when you come to church, come with this attitude that I want to learn something from you today, Lord. I want, to, I want you to teach me your ways. I want you to speak to me. And if you do, if you come with a heart that's receptive and open, God will show you things. Amen. The Spirit of God will show you things. It may not even be what the preacher preached on, but the Spirit of God can show you stuff. Amen. I remember uh, one of my pastors said that he was preaching a sermon on tithing, of all things. And, that, and then this couple come up after church Say, you know, while you were preaching, Pastor, we got really convicted and we're living in sin. We want to get married. Said, what? <laughs> we preach on tithing, but God dealt with them about getting married. See, God can do that. Amen. 
So come with an attitude of spirit that says, I want to, I want you to show me something. So one of the things that happens as we grow in Christ is we begin to develop personal moral convictions. Amen. And that is about what is right and wrong, what is good and evil. And when you start to learn what the Bible says about certain things, and you begin to agree with God and, and allow God to change your mind, what happens is God begins to build within you moral character. Amen. Moral character. An excellent moral character that you are now able to not only know the difference between good and evil, but you're able to do it. You learn a new way of living. It's a lifestyle change. You know, they say if you really want to lose weight, it requires a lifestyle change. And I don't like that. Because that means no tortillas, no chicharrones, no, you know, no sopa, none of those things that I love. However, you know, it's a lifestyle change when you serve Jesus. Amen. Amen. You learn that you can't hate people. <gasps> what? You can't hate people. What do you mean I can't hate them? No, you can't hate them. Jesus said, love your neighbor as yourself. And then he went further. And he said, love your enemy. What? What do you mean love my enemy? We have to do what he did. Yes. He loved us when we were still sinners. Yes. He prayed for those who were crucifying him. Amen. He's looking at the people who tormented him, lied about him, uh, uh, wrongly convicted him, and had him hanging on a cross suffering, and he prayed for them. He said, Father, forgive them, for they don't know what they're doing. They're in. Instead of hating people, we should pray for them. Yes. Pity them. Some people are very hard to love. Yes. Aren't they? Yes. They're prickly like a porcupine. <laughs> you know? And, and they're mean. But we have to learn to love and learn to forgive. Those are, sometimes that's harder than quit smoking pot or cigarettes. Or, you know, letting go of an addiction. We have to learn how to be givers and not just takers. Amen. Amen. You know, we were real good at taking. This is all hard stuff. That's what I'm talking about. The, the high way to heaven is hard. Jesus said this way is difficult. It's hard to do these things. It's hard to be disciplined. And we have to do all of this with a good attitude. Amen. We don't like that. I'll do it, but I'm not going to be happy about it. You want me to love my neighbor? I'm reminded of that scene from Crossing the Switchblade where the, the gang members are all in, you know, they're, they're in the theater and he's saying to love one another and one of the, you know, it was the blood, no, it wasn't the blood, it was the bishops and the Mau Maus, you know, and the bishops were black and the Mau Maus were, were like uh, Puerto Ricans and all different, and, and one, of the, one of the guys on this side, he says, you want me to love? And he pulls up his shirt and he says, see, I got this from one of those picks. I'll love them with a sharp knife. That's not how God wants us to love one another. He wants us to have a good attitude. He wants us to do his will without complaining. Amen. You know? He wants us to obey him from our heart. He doesn't want us to be like that little girl. Did you hear about the little girl? She, she would... They're, the family driving around the road, she's standing on the back seat. And her dad says, sit down and put your seatbelt on. And she's just standing, disobeying. 
Sit down, put your seatbelt on. No, she won't do it. She says, I'm going to stop this car and I'm going to spank you and you're going to put your seatbelt on. And so she, finally she, she yields to the threat and sits down and puts her seatbelt on and then he hears her mumbling in the back. She says, I might be sitting down on the in outside, but I'm standing up on the inside. <laughs> Sometimes we could be that way, huh? I, I'm doing what I'm supposed to do, but I'm not liking it. Mm -hmm. That's attitude. Sometimes we can be in ministry serving with an attitude. That's not good. So he says, this is the high road. This is the road I want you to walk on. This is the road that leads to heaven. He said, this is a difficult road. It's the highway. Not the low way. We know where the low way goes, right? The low road leads to hell. He calls us to live higher, to a higher standard in our lives. Amen. Amen. He said, don't even look at a woman to lust after her. Because if you do, you already sin. Uh, I, I, you, know, you go to any construction site and tell the guys there that, they'll think you're out of your mind. And he says, you, you need to have a good attitude and don't be complaining about it. And at the same time, we're to help others get onto the high road and help them to stay on the road till they make it to heaven. It's hard. It's a hard way. I want you to think about this because to be able to do this, we need God to help us. Amen. Amen. Because in ourselves, we, we can't do it. We'll be like that, that one guy, I'll love him with a knife. <laughs> I'll love him, I'll show you. And the, the truth is, the only way we can stay on this high way to heaven is if God helps us. Amen. Amen. You know, when you look at what's required and you think about doing this in your own strength, you're like, no way. I can't do this. You're asking too much from me, God. And you know, the thing about Jesus is that he never asks us to do something that he didn't do. He did all these things. Amen. He never sinned. He was tempted, but he didn't do it. He was a man of prayer. He honored God with his life. He loved his enemies. He forgave them. He helped people who couldn't help themselves. He helped people who could do nothing for him. That describes every one of us. So when you look at what's required to walk with God and do the things that he says are necessary, it's very easy to despair and say, it can't be done. And I'm telling you that it can't be done in our own strength because we need God to help us. Amen. Amen. So we come to realize I can't do this. I need help and I have good news for you. Our help comes from the Lord. Amen. Listen to uh, Psalm, uh, Psalm 1, Psalm one twenty one. It's a short psalm, so I'll read the whole thing to you. It says, I will lift up my eyes to the hills from whence comes my help? Question mark. My help comes from the Lord who made heaven and earth. He will not allow your foot to be moved. He who keeps you will not slumber. Behold, he who keeps Israel shall neither slumber nor sleep. The Lord is your keeper. The Lord is your shade at your right hand. The sun shall not strike you by day, nor the moon by night. The Lord shall preserve you from all evil. He shall preserve your soul. The Lord shall preserve your going in <coughs> and your coming out from this time forward, or, or uh, from this time forth, and even forevermore. Amen. What powerful words. My help comes from the Lord. 
in Isaiah 40. It says, have you not known, verse 28, have you not heard the everlasting God, the Lord, the creator of the ends of the earth, neither faints nor is weary. His understanding is unsearchable. He gives power to the weak. And to those who have no might, he increases strength. Even the youth shall faint and be weary, and the young men shall utterly fail. But those who wait on the Lord, or those who serve the Lord, shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings like eagles. They shall run and not be weary. They shall walk and not faint. Amen. What do you think sustains us in our service for God? Not us. It's Him. We get weary. We get tired. But it's the Lord who renews our strength. It's the Lord who helps us to overcome. Amen. David wrote these words in Psalm 54. Come with great power, O God, and rescue me. Defend me by your might. Listen to my prayer, O God. Pay attention to my plea, for strangers are attacking me. Violent people are trying to kill me. They care nothing for God, but God is my helper. God, the Lord keeps me alive. May the evil plans of my enemies be turned against them. Do as you promise and put an end to them. I will sacrifice a voluntary offering to you. I will praise your name, O Lord, for it is good. For you have rescued me from my troubles and helped me triumph over my enemies. God is my helper. The Lord keeps me alive. These things that God calls us to do, we cannot do. Not in our own strength. The Apostle Paul was crying <coughs> to God. I guess you could say he was, he was complaining because he had a thorn in his flesh. We don't know what it was, but it was tormenting him. In 2 Corinthians chapter 12, he writes of this. He said he understood what it was. And he said he had had incredible visions. And he said, lest I should be exalted above measure by the abundance of revelation. The revelations of thorn in my flesh. A thorn was given to me. A messenger of Satan to buffet me, lest I be exalted above measure. And he said, concerning this thing, I pleaded with the Lord three times that it might depart from me. You know what God told him? No. He said to him, Jesus said these words to him, My grace is sufficient for you. For my strength is made perfect in weakness. Therefore, most gladly, I will rather boast in my infirmities that the power of Christ may rest upon me. Therefore, I take pleasure in infirmities and reproaches and needs and persecutions in distresses. And I want you to hear what he says. He says, I do this for Christ's sake. And he says this. For when I am weak, then I am strong. Amen. Amen. I'm not strong because I'm strong. I'm strong because he's strong. Yes. Amen. And the things that I do, I don't do in my own strength. I do this because God helps me. The children of Israel were trapped. The uh, Pharaoh and his army is, is coming. The Red Sea is in front of them. And they start to complain. They start to moan to to Moses, and they say these words. They said, "They said, uh, because there were no graves in Egypt, you've taken us away to die in the wilderness. Why have you so dealt with us, bring to bring us out of Egypt? Is this not the word that we told you in Egypt, saying, Leave us alone, that we may serve the Egyptians? For it would have been better for us to serve the Egyptians than that we should die in the wilderness." Complainers. Verse 13, and Moses said to the people, do not be afraid, stand still and see the salvation of the Lord, which he will accomplish for you today. For the Egyptians whom you see today, you shall see again no more forever. And what happened? God told them, raise your staff over the Red Sea. And God parted the sea, led the children of Israel through six million people, went through the Red Sea on dry ground, a wall of water on this side, a wall of water on that side. All the fish looking at them. And then when they get to the other side, God said, raise up your staff over the sea. And God drowned the armies of Pharaoh. He fought for them. Amen? Amen. In verse 25, it says, he took off their chariot wheels so that they drove them with difficulty. 
God did that. The Egyptians said, let us flee from the face of Israel, for the Lord fights for them against the Egyptians. See, God, God knows how to give strength to the weak. Amen. God knows how to help his people. And you know, Jesus said the road, the road to eternal life is difficult. But he, he encourages us. He says it is difficult, but you can make it because I'm with you. Amen. I'm going to help you. Amen. It's hard to serve God, isn't it? It's hard to do right. It's hard to, to you know, go to church three times a week. It's hard to go on outreach. It's hard to, to pray faithfully every day. It's hard to sacrifice your hard-earned money by tithing and, and giving offerings in the church. It's hard. It's hard to love your neighbor. It's hard to love your enemy. Sometimes it's hard to love your spouse. <laughs> but the truth is, God helps us. Listen to what Jude wrote, and I'll close with this. Jude wrote, verse 24, 25. Now to him who is able to keep you from stumbling. Who, who is that? That's our God, our Father. And to present you faultless before the presence of his glory with exceeding glory. To God, our Savior, who alone is wise, be glory and majesty, dominion and power, both now and forever. Amen. He is able to keep you from stumbling. Sometimes we slip and fall. Read Pilgrim's Progress. It's a, it's a great book because, you know, in that there are many diversions, many uh, uh, you know, forms of resistance, false teachers, all these various things, but God helps him and sees him through. Jesus said, difficult is the way which leads to life. The high way to heaven is a hard way. But he didn't call us onto this path and expect us to do it ourselves. He called us and he's given us everything we need to be able to make it to heaven. And so I want to encourage you, trust in the Lord. Make Jesus number one in your life. Seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all the things that you need will be added to you. All the strength you need will be given to you. Because you may not know this or not, but I'm going to tell you, God wants you to go to heaven more than you want to go there. And he will give you everything you need to make it. Amen. You look at the, the things you're struggling with now. We all struggle with something, don't we? Put it in God's hands. Let him help you. Let him deliver you. The things that you look at, they look like mountains to you. Bring them to the Lord in prayer. and You'll, you'll find that we serve a God who knows how to level mountains. Amen. He knows how to make the path smooth. Amen. Let's bow our heads together as we bring our service to a close. We really appreciate you today coming to church. And I was praying, I said, Lord, give me something that's going to help your people. It's going to encourage them. It's going to just show them the way and Give them the strength to be able to serve God. I know it's hard. And I appreciate you coming to church this morning. I know it's an effort to get up to make it. But I'm here to tell you that, that we have a God who, who is invested in us. We have a God who loves us. And who has committed himself to help us make it. 